Okay, so today what I wanted to do is, and you can view this during, before, after we study, um, I wanted to take a look at the gunpowder empires of the early uh, modern age, the Ottomans, the Safavid, and the Mughals. And I wanted to do it in a three-way Venn diagram. And what you see here is in the middle we'll do all the similarities, and there are tons. And then we'll start going over their differences. Um, and you'll find that there are some similarities between them that are kind of private that don't involve all three. So we'll see how it goes. First, and you can see there's a lot, um, all three of these gunpowder empires that came into being were Islamic. Um, so to a degree, they their figurehead leaders were also religious leaders. They used the, the faith to also promote what they wanted. Um, they were all Turkish, meaning they were uh, of the, the Mongol descent. The Mongols came in, the Turks fought. Um, they're not all interrelated, they're just of Turkish descent. They were land-based empires, though by far the Ottomans also reached into the Mediterranean. Um, they all had high points somewhere between 1500 and 1700. Those high points are going to unfortunately be followed by a severe low points as the rise of Western Europe kind of trumps them. They all had states led by autocrats. That does not mean they did not have bureaucracies that supported them, but at the end of the day, they were led by shahs, they were led by emperors, kings, whatever you would like to call them. All three of them lacked the intellectual movements that you really saw in Western Europe. Um, there are religious movements, of course, and they were all influenced by what had happened during the Abbasid era, um, that high water mark of the Islamic world. But there wasn't a lot of intellectual movements outside the church and the state leadership. I would say all three of the gunpowder empires, uh, more of the Ottomans and the Mughals, did have tolerance. They had tolerance for uh, different faiths, different peoples. Um, they were not, uh, though they might be of a Islamic religion, that doesn't mean they didn't have different sects, they didn't have different languages spoken, even different ethnicities inside their empires. And lastly for here, the last major similarity is they are all going to decline because their wealth began to decline. And as the rest, the West rises and finds naval power going around the world, um, this wealth will be now centered in Western Europe, kind of stripping their uh, former location here as the hub uh, of the Silk Road and whatnot. Well, hopefully that all made sense. Now, that's a lot of similarities, which kind of goes to say, though we are talking about three empires, uh, it is possible for empires to be more similar than even different. Now, their differences are sharp. They all have different histories, different paths, um, and that partially located uh, with their geography. So these are their three founders, and you'll see that they weren't even founded around the exact same time. Osman is going to help take over the Anatola Peninsula and uh, start knock, knock, knocking on the Byzantine door. Um, Ishmael and Babur. We'll be studying Babur a lot more in class. So these are when the, the, the empires were all founded. The fact that they have a founding, a finder, is also linked to the fact that they all came to power or into being because of the barrel of a gun. They all were followers of a leader, a warrior. The warrior conquered. The warrior conquered more, thus set in stone the concept of an empire. Now, just because they had conquering leaders does not mean that that leader is the leader we usually signify with the high water mark. Um, for example, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mehmed II, he is going to be successful in conquering Constantinople. And with the fall of Constantinople, we have the rise of Istanbul. 
uh, Suleiman. Suleiman will be a great conqueror, conquering all the way into Eastern Europe, but also codifying or codifying a lot of laws. That's why we saw sometimes call Suleiman the lawgiver. Abbas the Great of the Safavid, also famous for being a conqueror. Now his challenge was that the Safavid sat in between the Ottoman and the Mughals, but yet he was still able to uh, fare pretty well against both of the West and the East, but also going north was able to solidify land. He also westernized the, the military in the Safavid and made even connections with some Europeans. It's not easy for the Safavid to have the connections with the Europeans as easy as it is with the Ottomans and of course the subcontinent of the Mughals. And down here, we're going to do these in class, but you got Akbar the Great, uh, Jahangir, Shah Jahan, some great um, figureheads and leaders of the Mughals who are, are massive builders, who even if you're Akbar, cre helped create a faith of his own, um, and we will get to them. Now, I found that the Ottomans and the Mughals were those who were able to do the greatest of construction, and I'll, I'll elaborate. But let's just say, with the Mughal and the Ottoman connections with the West, they were absolutely affluent. The Mughals might have been the most affluent empire of the early modern age. And with that money, with that wealth, and their figureheads, their leaders, stops using the term figurehead, they were able to build. Um, Suleiman, or the Muslims here in the Ottoman Empire, were able to help create their own mosque, um, very close to the Hagia Sophia. Uh, Mehmed II, when he is able to take over Constantinople, helps take down, if you will, the Hagia Sophia as St. Sophia's Church and help create uh, a mosque there. Down here, Taj Mahal, Fatipur Sikri, and the Red Fort are some of just three great constructions led by the Mughals, probably demonstrating their massive affluence through their trade. Now, this doesn't mean that the Safavid weren't builders. Um, Abbas the Great will help create a new capital in Isfahan. Um, when he builds it, he builds mosques, he supports the arts. Um, but it's just never, ever at the same level as the Ottomans and the Mughals. Now, when we talk about terminology like uh, the Devshirmi and the Janissaries, they are largely just found, those terms, in the Ottoman Empire. And uh, if you'll remember from the class, the Devshirmi were typically nine or ten-year-olds who were probably very much Christian and from Europe who were taken hostage who were then uh, be became Muslims. Uh, they were trained specifically to find the faith, but also eventually the more elite Devshirmi joined the Janissaries. So the Janissaries are partially a slave-driven driven regime of militant uh, military uh, leaders. Um, now the Janissaries, unlike what you'll find in the Mughals and the Safavid, the Janissaries, the military-industrial complex, has a lot of power in the Ottomans to the point that if you were the leader of the Ottomans, you had to make sure you followed or worked with or appeased the Janissaries, worse the threat of revolt. Now, the Janissaries might be great and it allows the Ottomans to be a force, to be a conquering force, even in Eastern Europe, but the Janissaries, as they became more powerful, will actually almost bring down the centralized state. Um, right here you'll see that the Ottomans and the Mughals were Sunni Muslims who practiced the, uh, the, the jizya. The jizya, if you remember, is when you tax non-believers. So if you are a non-Muslim, you weren't persecuted. There was a lot of tolerance towards you, but you'd have to pay a tax. Now, I will say, like, Arangzeb down here with the Mughals 
and different Ottoman leaders, they were not as tolerant at others. I mean, just the concept of Dev Sharmi shows that, you know, the Ottomans were not always the most tolerant. Um, so there's always something you can disprove. Now, while the Ottomans and the Mughals were Sunni Muslims, the Safavid, and definitely a distinct strength of theirs, was they were Shia Muslims. These are the people of Iran, part of Iraq, and a little bit of Afghanistan. These Shia Muslims absolutely had a more centralized uh, relationship with the church. And I'm going to be very ambiguous with this, but where the Ottomans and the Mughals were Sunni, they still led in a very secular way. Where, in my opinion, in my reading, the Safavid did not really separate the secular from the non-secular. They led through the church. And that is still very similar to today, where Iran, the descendant of the Persians, still has the, the role of the Ayatollah um, bearing down on the weight of the president of modern Iran. Now, I've come down here, and I know I went back to the similarities, but you'll see I'm going to link them to differences here. Now, the Ghazi. These are the militant warriors found in all three different powers. In fact, if you were a leader, you were given the title of Ghazi. Why I bring that up? If you were a Ghazi, if you were titled a Ghazi, that means you were a conqueror, a warrior. And I would say, I mean, they're nicknamed the Gunpowder Empires for a reason. All three of these were powerful, um, not just because they centralized their own religious and political states, but because they were conquerors. Um, now, the Safavid had the hardest time because they were in a two-front war, fighting with the Ottomans on the west and the Mughals on the east. Um, so I would say that they struggled to take more territory over, um, but they still did expand northward. The Ottomans, at the, their height under Suleiman, they went all the way to uh, the Palestine area, North Africa, and deep into um, Eastern Europe. Now, the Safavid had a militant group called, and I don't know how to pronounce this, the Quizzlebash. We nicknamed them the Redheads because they, read, they wore these red turbans. But the Quizzlebash um, kind of helped get all of the Safavid Empire started. So you could almost say that the Safavids are founded on militants. And these were religious militants who used the barrel of the gun to solidify and eventually create a state. Now, this will play out in wars. Wars between the Ottomans and the Safavid, and about a hundred years later, wars between the Safavid and the Mughals. Again, geography, all sitting on the Safavid shoulders. At the Battle of Chaldaran, the Ottomans will officially push back the Safavid um, to the point that the Safavid give up um, their one-time capital and they have to kind of give up their desires to head out west because it's not going to work and it's destabilizing the nation. In fact, Abbas the Great, one of the first things he does when he comes into power is he makes a uh, the Treaty of Istanbul, which pretty much says the Ottoman, to the Ottomans, have everything we've ever conquered. There you go. We're sorry for fighting. And now the Safavid are a little bit more successful down here fighting the Mughals. They were able to capture Kandahar, um, which was on the most western outskirts of the Mughal Empire. The Battle of Kandahar um, limits Mughal expansion, protects Safavids, um, that's where the Peacock Throne was held, and the Peacock Throne will be taken by the Safavid, and to be honest, never seen again. Now, over here, we're closing down on my lecture. I contend the Safavid don't drastically fall. They might shrink, but they are the descendants of what we call the Persians. The descendants of the, their descendants will be the Iranians. They weren't a gigantic empire. They just get chiseled away to become a state, still dominated by Shia Muslims. Where over here you'll see with the rise of the West, 
Um, the Ottomans will be kept in check. They will eventually lose power in the Mediterranean with trade. And then as the Silk Road dies out and Istanbul is not a hub, trade is going around the world, they really become the sick man, if you will, of Europe. The Mughals, to even a different degree, they are conquered. They are conquered by the British. They are influenced by the Portuguese. And over time, power is taken away from the Mughal Empire, Mughal throne, Mughal traders, Mughal power, and given to the foreigners, who by the 1800s will officially take over the subcontinent we call India today. So there it is. Um, in 15 minutes, uh, what I think I did is kind of go over a lot of the fine, the greater, broader points. I mean, these are the people, terms, and events you really should know when trying to sum up um, the gunpowder empires. I'd encourage you to read about them, take a look at some of the architecture shown here, um, make sure these are the names you could at least pull up and recite. I'm pretty good. We're at 16 minutes. Have a good one.